Thank you, Kelly. And it is so good to be here with you this morning. And, and Mike put the clock in front of me. You know that's a sign. Uh, we are um, so glad for this opportunity to worship with you today, as well as to really um, share from God's word. I'm so excited when I learned that you were um, going through the book of Nehemiah as you're considering missions. Um, this book is just a, a powerful book, and there's, there's a lot to it. Um, it. Yes, it's a book of history. Uh, it's, a, it's a book about how to carry out visions. It's, it's a book on leadership. Uh, every pastor's got it on their, on their bookshelf. Uh, it's, it's, it's got hints how to deal with difficult people and how to hit the hard situations. But, but I want you to know today it is much, much more. So this morning, I'm going to read to you from the, the passage in Nehemiah 2, verses 6 through 9. I'm going to put it in context, then Mike is going to come and share, and then I'm going to come and wrap it up. So listen now to the Word of God from Nehemiah 2, verses 6 through 9. Then the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him definite time. And I said to the king, if it please the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river, that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he might give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress, which is by the temple, for the wall of the city and for the house to which I will go. And the king granted them to me because the good hand of my God was on me. Then I came to the governors of the provinces beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent me with officers of the army and horsemen. This is the word of God for the people of God. You know, this passage is part of a much wider context. Ezra and Nehemiah were actually treated as one book together in earliest Hebrew manuscripts. And if, if you were watching a series on Netflix, this is sort of how it would go. And of course, any good series, you start out in that first episode and, and you get the setting, you get a hint of where people have been and what's going on. As the series begins out, God's people have been brought into exile. The Babylonians have taken them captive they're carried out of their precious land because of sin, because of idolatry, because they'd been ignoring God's law and the God who loved them. There was injustice in the land, corruption, and they were taken away. They were filled with disappointment and despair, captives in a land that was not their own. And yet, they remembered the promises of God promises that restoration would come about, promises that there would be a rebuilding of the temple, it would all be made new, promises of a messianic king from the line of David who would come to rule and to set them free, promises that the words spoken to Abraham would come into being and they would be blessed and the nations blessed through them. They were waiting. And so, the season one begins. It's actually Ezra, chapters one through six. God's working through a Persian king of all people. Zerubbabel, one of Israel's own, leads out a large group of exiles and they return to the land and they rebuild the temple. Season two, Ezra seven through 10. Again, a Persian king, this time Artaxerxes. Ezra, a scholar, rises up and again leads a group back to the land. Ezra goes to teach the Torah, to teach God's word, to restore the community. We're now in season three, Nehemiah 1 through 7. Again, King Artaxerxes, a contemporary of Ezra's, rises up. It's the cupbearer, Nehemiah. You heard the story last week. He was sad before the king. He gets permission to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Well, each of these, each of these seasons have their own odd endings. 
with Zerubbabel's work, there was anguish because when the elders saw the new temple, where was God's glory? And in season two, the last episode ends with confusion as, as the scribe is calling for the people to send their wives away and children away, those that had mixed in among them. Season three's last episode ends a little bit strangely too. They would built the wall, Nehemiah's work was completed, but there had been so much turmoil. Couldn't it have been done a different way? Well, at a basic level, our passage today speaks about God as provider. But keep in mind, it's within this context. We learn that God can work through anyone, even unbelievers like Persian kings. We learn there's a connection between prayer and provision. We're reminded that before we launch into projects, we need to be in prayer. And when we ask, when we ask for the resources, ask boldly. Nehemiah received lumber, letters of permission, even protection. Nehemiah also asked for what the people couldn't provide. And I think this is an important point for us in missions as well. He asked for what the people couldn't accomplish. They could provide the work, but they didn't have the resources like the timber. That's what he asked for. We're reminded in this story as well that God is the provider. Just like in the New Testament when Paul talks about his work for God, where he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. This is the same story in action. God is the provider. The permissions, the letters, the goods. It is by God's good and gracious hand. God's omnipotent hand can turn obstacles into opportunities. Obstacles into opportunities. Mike? Our God is a good God and God does provide. You know, when COVID hit here, when we got back to the States last March, um, we prepared for the worst. We thought that this was going to be a, another replay of 2008, and it sure was, and then some. But 2008 was a pretty good replay for us, as one of the things that we have is we have fantastic, tremendous, faithful prayer warriors. And some of you, when we came in here, you talk about you receive our blog and you pray for us, and so we, we know that when we have people praying, that God's provision always follows prayer. Back in 2008, when the crisis hit, we saw missionaries and organizations uh, leaving Thailand and closing up, in the, and uh, we, we had orphanages that would call us, that would go, you know, Mike, Sherry, uh, we've got 60 kids here to feed and, and, and house, and we have no way, we have no way to do it. Our, our missionary left, uh, the churches that were sponsoring us uh, stopped sending funds because that's usually the first thing that gets shut off, the first thing that gets cut in the budget for churches when things get tight is missions, isn't it? And, uh, and you know, we just knew that it wasn't God's will to have children go hungry, is it? And so what do you do? You go, okay, we'll help you through this school year. Let's find other places for these kids to be at. That happened not just once or twice. That was three times. So during that 2008 crisis, not only did we uh, not lose funds, we had to actually increase our budget. And God and God's people came through. More specifically, Kentucky Methodists like you came through. And I want you to know Kentucky Methodists are a special breed. And uh, you all, you all are generous. Even when it gets, even when it, you have to tighten your belts, you stay that way. And so when this crisis hit, there was no difference. Instead of being able to decrease our budget, we had, because of the lockdowns, we had uh, people that could not work and they've not been able to for a year because it's, uh, the tourist industry is just totally 
shut down right now. And so because of your faithfulness, we've been able to give food relief, and especially in the urban churches that we have. But you know, because of your help, we've also been able to help these Blessing Home children and their family. We have four Blessing Homes, and as a matter of fact, before the pandemic, we had three, and we opened up a fourth one during this time because of God's provision, because of God's provision through God's people. You've been supporting our mission for a long time now, and because of you, over 600 children have been helped in Blessing Home. Blessing Home is our ministry to save and protect children from being enslaved in the child sex trade or in the drug trades. At the first Blessing Home we had, uh, we targeted neighborhoods where trafficking was just rampant. As a matter of fact, the neighborhoods we had around our Patea Center, 94% of the kids were being trafficked in the sex brothels or in the opium dens before they reached the age of 18. And it started at the young age of eight or nine years old. So for most of these kids in these neighborhoods, it wasn't when they, if they were gonna get trafficked, it was just a matter of when. But I want you to know because of your support, it's made such a huge difference in the lives of these kids in these neighborhoods that now, in these neighborhoods, that trafficking is down to a trickle. And a matter of fact, during this past year, we've had seven of our kids that are going to university now. Sorry, I get choked up when I think of these things. What a difference between having a 12-year-old in the brothel to having them studying marketing or pharmacy. And so thank you very much for your support that just made that possible to be able to not only expand to another center, but to be sending these kids to, to university as well. Uh, through your support, Church planting did not stop. We have the Pioneer Pasture Program where we plant churches in unreached counties in Thailand. 75% of the counties in Thailand don't have a single Christian church whatsoever. The people who live in those counties have no chance to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And through your support during this pandemic time, we've been able to plant three more churches. So there are 42 churches in 42 counties that never had a church before. Now now are uh, being reached for Jesus Christ. I want to thank you because it's your faithfulness in prayer that, uh, that we've been able to uh, really go with the Abundant Life Training Program, which Sherry started uh, four years ago. And, and it's a program for teaching uh, Thai people how to manage their money in biblical ways. We had a real issue with farmers in Thailand. When we came to Thailand 16 years ago, 58% of Thai farmers owned their own land. But as of two years ago, this was before the pandemic, it dropped from 58% down to 15%. Can you imagine that as predatory lending? They were making enough money they knew how to, I mean, their, their rice crops and other crops were getting in good money, but they were not managing their money in the biblical ways. And so uh, we have these abundant life groups that Sherry trains them to, uh, uh, to have weekly groups where they develop savings muscle. They learn how to have a uh, save up for an emergency fund. They learn how to budget. They learn uh, how to pay off their debts. And during this COVID time, uh, we and our staff have not been able to make, uh, we've not been able to do trainings, but we've had lots of extra time for making books and video resources, uh, things that, that we've been doing much too slow before, God made the time for us. With our Bible College, Global Theological Institute, back six years ago we made the transition at Global Theological Institute to be a distance learning seminary so that lay pastors would not have to leave their churches behind and, and, and orphan their churches to just come and study the Bible. 
they could do that from home. So when the pandemic hit, this ministry not only did not slow down, but it sped up because all of our urban uh, students, because they couldn't work, guess what they had more time for? Study. And so we have a bumper crop of graduates this year and next year who will be going and serving all throughout Thailand. Praise God. So we want to thank you for, uh, for your prayers and for your support that make the mission possible. God is good. And when we pray, God provides. At a deeper level, our passage really does, again, fit within the wider context. Really, it's speaking to a major doctrine of our faith, the providence of God. What is that? What is the providence of God? Well, first, that, that God is sovereign, that he is in control. Despite what we see all around us and what the news is putting out every day and that makes us wonder, the fact is, God is in control. Nothing is able to stand up against him, to defy him, or do what would defeat him in the end. This passage also affirms the truth that there is one and only one God, and that he has created this world. This world is subject to him, and that this one and only God has a plan, has a plan for this world. Luke 1.37 in Thai, it says, Prawa. Nothing is impossible for God. We go back to our series, season four, Nehemiah 8 through 12. It's the climactic buildup. Ezra and Nehemiah join forces. They're about to bring about spiritual renewal, a celebration. The people come together to learn God's word. The wrap-up episode, though, is Nehemiah 13. It's a dramatic season ending, and it's not what we would imagine it to be. Nehemiah is making a tour. The temple, Zerubbabel's work, is neglected. Unqualified people are heading it up. And the Torah that's being taught, Ezra's work, people are working on the Sabbath. They're not following God's law. And as he goes about and looks at the walls and the gate, his own work, he's seeing people setting up markets, trying to operate markets again on the Sabbath, right from his walls and gates. The wrap-up leaves us hanging. What is going on? The series started out with hope, and here it is. Is it ending in disappointment? There's another episode, another season to come. And we are here. Despite the efforts, despite human efforts, which over and over again disappoint and fail, we're reminded that God's will and purpose comes, that God is our provider through Jesus, that the promises that are fulfilled come through Jesus. Jesus taking on flesh for our redemption. Because God knew our feeble attempts would fail. We would need a savior. Ephesians 3.11 says that this was in accordance with the eternal purpose carried out through Jesus Christ our Lord. That all things would be united in Christ. All of the seasons were pointing up to this to him. God did not allow the failures of his people to humiliate them, but to humble them and us, to realize our absolute need for Jesus. Because for all of our efforts to do, if he's not in our heart, human efforts come to naught. We need his provision. Romans 11:36 says, for from him, through him, and for him, all things come. Brothers and sisters, I share with you today a reminder that all of missions, all that we participate in together is about him. 
our absolute need for Jesus and that there is a world that is waiting to hear. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless.